Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Josh Owen. I'm the Massimo and Lella Vignelli Distinguished Professor of Design and the Director of the Vignelli Center for Design Studies. Tonight, we host the fifth lecture of this academic year's Vignelli Design Conversations series presented by Design Milk and made possible in part by the generosity of RIT alumnus Chris Bailey and Bailey Brand Consulting. Rochester Institute of Technology's Vignelli Center for Design Studies is an international hub for education, research, collaboration, and advocacy, which expands the scope of the programs in the College of Art and Design School of Design. The facility houses the archive of renowned designers Lella and Massimo Vignelli, whose works are icons of international design. The center and archives sit within RIT's College of Art and Design, which was built on the traditional territory of the Onondaga, or people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as Seneca people, the keepers of the Western Door. They are one of the six sovereign nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We honor the land on which RIT was built and recognize the unique relationship that the indigenous stewards have with this land. That relationship is the core of their traditions, cultures, and histories. And we recognize the history of genocide, colonization, and assimilation of indigenous people that took place on this land. Mindful of these histories, we work towards understanding, acknowledging, and reconciling. As stewards of history and content, we must acknowledge and seek to learn from our context, bad and good, ugly and beautiful. This applies to the Vignelli Center as with any archive. The Vignellis taught us that design is a systematic framework for solving the world's most intractable problems. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that while we as humans are adaptable, our societies and systems have major flaws. We're at a point when we need to have difficult discussions and work to create a new balance in the world. In this, design must play a critical role. As the new director, I aim to make the Vignelli Center even more accessible and applicable by bringing in exciting guest contributors from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds who are using design in innovative ways. The Vignelli's design is one philosophy leaves us with a universal message that design is a lens through which we can envision a more inclusive tomorrow. Before introducing tonight's guest, I'd like to take a few moments to set the stage. Out of respect for our presenter, participants will be muted for the duration of the event. We do encourage you to enter your questions that you have for our presenter using the Q&A feature, and we'll try to get as many of them as possible answered during our closing Q&A segment. Thank you to Jace Rivera and Samantha Payne, who will be our sign language interpreters tonight. Our esteemed guest this evening has been delivering design lessons to industry and to the classroom for many years making her impact significant across the built environment and the minds that continue to shape it. I had the pleasure of meeting Marissa many years ago when I was a graduate student at the Rhode Island School of Design where she was a young professor and I followed her career with great admiration ever since. Though Marissa has recently been celebrated by magazines such as Lux Interior and Design and House Beautiful as a designer to watch, her career speaks to a long-standing dialogue. It is a dialogue between design and craft that she knows has been essential in determining success. The voice Marissa brings is fueled by a deep understanding and respect of furniture history and construction. But the action she takes is contemporary. As an experienced design director working for multiple brands throughout her career, she's become highly fluent in recognizing the varying design needs from custom studios to licensed global brands. After receiving her degree from Rhode Island School of Design in Industrial Design, Marissa began her career with Dakota Jackson as creative director of his luxury custom furniture studio. Her love of collaborating with diverse talent influenced her own eventual business Brown Graves, and teaching at RISD and Parsons, pushing her students to focus on transforming materials. Eventually, her approach attracted Martha Stewart Living Omni Media. As VP Design Director for Martha Stewart, she designed and managed furniture across a variety of home and living spaces. Marissa evolved to manage teams of designers to answer to large-scale production 
while navigating licensed partnerships for Macy's, the Home Depot, Bernhardt, Staples, and others. In 2018, the CEO of Stickley, an historic furniture, hardwood furniture company located here in our own Finger Lakes region of New York State, was impressed enough with Marissa's deep knowledge of materials, processes, and trends to invite her to become Stickley's first female director of design in the company's 120 year history. Since that historic appointment, Marissa's worked closely with hardwood specialists and craftspeople on the factory floor to realize hundreds of pieces she's personally designed, many of which continue to win industry accolades, such as House Beautiful, listing her as a 2020 visionary. Outside of, the, of her work in industry, uh, Marissa has long maintained a home in Brooklyn with her three girls, filmmaker husband, and their dog, who might make a special appearance tonight. <laughs> we don't know. They make annual trips to North Pitcher, New York, to a pragmatic farmhouse that has been in her family for 180 years. In an age of digital tools and shortcuts, Marissa still embraces the tactile respect for craft that exceptional form requires. Please join me in a big virtual welcome for a remarkable individual whose deep understanding of design, craft, and industry have earned her a reputation as one of today's important design leaders. Welcome to Marissa Brown. Thank you, Josh, so much for that introduction. And I wanna thank you for all you're doing with the Vignelli Center and connecting different design voices in the field. Um, it's really incredible what you've done. So thank you. I also wanna thank all the RIT students here tonight who've made it. I wish I was with you all in person, um, but unfortunately that's not the case tonight. Um, and I wanna thank Design Milk for all they're doing, also connecting designers and different voices. Um, I'm Marissa Brown. I am, as Josh pointed out, a design director for Stickley Furniture. Um, I work out of my apartment remotely from Brooklyn and I um, travel up to upstate New York frequently to work with the factory and develop collections for them. Um, tonight's lecture is about the title of my lecture is when I could no longer touch my work. And I know that sounds kind of dramatic as a uh, title, but it was intentional. I wanted it to be provocative. I wanted it to um, speak about what it's been like uh, having a career, having you know been lucky enough to have a career, a longstanding career in design, working for brands, um, for big brands, Dakota Jackson, Martha Stewart, and then Stickley currently. And um, how along the way I have you know, pulled often from my earlier days at school where craft was so integral to my education and how that has informed and continued to inform my design as I work in a digital era. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and change, flip my screen here, share my screen with you all. Basically, you know, I started my design education at Rhode Island School of Design, and that was really, really important to, um, you know, my beginning of starting in the field of craft um, and design. And when I was at RISD, what was significant about my time of being there was that um, I was at school when computers were not there yet. We were, we were the last generation actually at RISD that were still drawing by hand. And um, after I graduated, of course, they moved into computers and embraced technology. But when I was there, craft was important and um, I embraced it. You know, I came into the department not knowing that much actually about what design meant. I think that through the act of um, working with materials, working with, you know, introducing um, the teachers, introducing us to machinery, to equipment, really set off this like spark in me that I could suddenly have um, the ability to make something. I remember um, making my first bowl on, a, uh, on the lathe and a wooden bowl and starting with this chunk of wood and that moment of transformation that occurred when I was turning this bowl and the excitement and kind of the, the um, beauty that came in that process of making something that I kind of fell in love with, that transformation, that um, tactile nature of creating something by hand. Um, 
And as I got more and more into materials and understanding their properties and kind of learning from them, um, I began to look at connections of materials. How do woods connect? What kind of um, connections can be had with metals? I started to research more, learn about wood, the different variations and, and qualities of woods from um, a grain standpoint and from a machining standpoint that you could reveal a quarter sawn wood or a cathedral cut and the subtleties that were occurring in those materials. Um, you know, I, I think that I didn't actually really understand entirely what design meant at that point. And I think that craft truly um, gave me voice or gave birth to design, which is kind of interesting idea. Um, and it's something that I forever um, fall back on in my career designing for Stickley, um, that I've always returned to these early days of um, excitement and the emotion that went with that. Um, there was a point in time at RISD where I didn't want to draw. I didn't like the idea of making schematics. And today, now looking back, it seems so crazy that I was so uh, anti-drafting or catting. And um, but I I realized actually a teacher gave an ultimatum in class that you couldn't enter the wood shop unless you actually had a drawing. And I remember that moment of thinking, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. But I think what I was struggling with was that I felt that by becoming so um, technical, I was going to lose the emotion. And um, it's interesting now, fast forward to uh, where I am in my career now and how I embrace technology, but I'm always trying to, to, to incorporate that emotion that I experienced when I was experiencing craft. Um, taking this one step further at school, Providence was located in an incredible community of artisans outside of RISD. So as I understood more and more that design was much more than just what I was doing you know, in the shop, um, that I was starting to develop actual designs that I needed to reach out to fabricators. And um, I had this you know, wonderful, respect at that point, um, working with metal spinners and, and um, metal shops where they were doing beautiful TIG welds and, um, and using those resources, but also having a complete admiration for people who had made their lifelong uh, mission just developing their craft and developing their skills and um, how inspiring that was. But not only that, how design is about communication. And um, often, you know, a drawing helps facilitate that communication and that dialogue. Um, I am gonna go ahead and flip my screen now because as I, uh, as I moved into, I already did, sorry. Uh, as I moved into, um, you know, a career in design, I knew that I was going to have to work in a company that uh, would allow me to keep on, you know, exploring all the things that I learned at RISD and that passion that was in me that I really wanted to continue. I moved to New York City and it was a time when the economy wasn't so great. Um, it wasn't the best of time to look for work. So I actually landed an internship at the studio of Dakota Jackson. He had a studio down in Soho at that time and uh, he was also, um, he had a space in Long Island, Long Island City, a factory. Um, if any of you don't know who Dakota Jackson is, he's a, a renowned furniture designer. His uh, luxury brand, his furniture is in museums. He, uh, he's an incredible personality, a storyteller. Uh, his designs have a beautiful uh, restraint to them and an elegance of merging manufacturing with uh, engineering. Um, it's less about the process, it's less about the final product in his studio and more about the process that you went through. So uh, eventually he moved his, his office to the factory. So I had this great experience of working in a manufacturing um, studio in this factory in Long Island City that looked over 
looked over the city, looked over the water to the UN building. I sat in that top floor up there and I was surrounded by um, craftsmen and Dakota himself. Uh, what I learned working with Dakota was um, something that I, to this day, you know, always strive for in my designs, which is the discipline of design and the discipline that it takes to be a designer. Um, the rigor that is involved in developing a form. Um, at that point, Dakota also didn't have computers. So I was drafting on my board. I was drawing um, with trace paper and um, I was sketching a lot. And Dakota's, um, you know, was, was preaching or talking to me about uh, his emotional connection to design. He was inspired a lot through dance. Um, he was a part of the, uh, the avant-garde scene in the 1970s down in Soho, um, where there were performing arts, music, uh, all of this culture coming together. And he was a part of a part of that. And that paid, played a big part of who he was and what he how he talked about design, um, dance being a big part of that. So he he was the one who taught me when I was starting to draw on the paper and learning how to sketch or you know, fine tuning my drawing skills, that the moment your pencil, the gesture occurs on that paper, that sets the trajectory forward and the movement of this object that you're creating. And that object then goes into the shop, it goes to the hands of the, the craftspeople, and the movement and the dance that's created by um, making these objects in the shop then the, the object comes back to you, your eye travels over this form. And then the last part, part being the experience of the body and coming into contact with this piece of furniture, if it was a chair or whatever. So these were very lofty ideas for me as a young designer. And uh, at first I wasn't sure, um, you know, where it was all going, but I, I enjoyed that dialogue. I enjoyed the, um, the discipline, as I've said, I enjoyed trying to perfect my skill. It's almost going back to music or uh, a musician perfecting their skill or their craft, or a woodworker learning how to, you know, master their craft. Um, so design suddenly became much larger for me as um, as an opportunity and something that I could explore. I, I found ways of working around um, ideas. I think this is something that we all can learn from in our careers that you know when you're doing something day in and day out, you sometimes have to be resourceful and think of different ways of articulating a form. So I started gravitating towards models. Um, I felt that the expression of manipulating materials again allowed me to come up with ideas that maybe I hadn't thought of before. Um, I, keep in mind, we didn't have, there was no Instagram. There were, we weren't using inspiration images at that time. It was very emotional, the process. It was very much about having a gut feeling about form and, and how you could um, fine tune it and commit to it. That was one thing I learned at Dakota's was how to commit to a form through design. Um, you know, when I, when I was at my board with trace paper and um, drawing there, you had to commit to that design. I've know, I know that I experience now today, I use computers all the time to design my collections for Stickley, that there's this tendency to be able to do so much so quickly and iterations after iterations, which is part of the design process because design is about um, process of elimination and finding, you know, finally getting to the essence of what you're trying to get to. But I, I think early, having early on in my career that ability to stick with something um, because it was on my board, I couldn't keep crumpling up trace paper and having this trash can filled with trace balls everywhere. I had to commit and it taught me a, a, a valuable lesson. Um, the wonderful thing about working at Dakota's was that I could leave, I could get up from my desk at any moment and step into the shop. And there was an incredible, um, you know, I made friends with all these woodworkers and craftsmen. I had the ability, had the opportunity, I should say, to 
um, engage in conversations about what they were working on and learn from them and um, understanding the value of um, the handcraft in manufacturing and how to, um, how to hold on to that craft, even though you might be doing mass production. At Dakotas, we were doing more kind of one-of-a-kind pieces, um, but there came a point where uh, he, he was actually the first um, American designer, uh, smaller scale designer doing, uh, who bought, who purchased a CNC five axis router. And all of a sudden that opened up um, a lot of different opportunities for Dakota in the shop. So the chair on the left is one of his iconic chairs. It's called the library chair. It was commissioned by Ingo Fried for the San Francisco Public Library. And um, the CNC helped facilitate uh, the mass production of those parts. But at the end of the day, this piece had to be assembled by hand and look effortless. Um, so that was something that we, we work towards often. Um, something about Dakota that also came from his past that affected the way I worked and influenced, inspired me was he um, comes from a family of magicians. His father was a magician and Dakota was trained professionally as a magician. Um, he talked to me a lot about the illusion of creating a trick, a, a magic trick and what it would take to go through the orchestration and the, the body movement and the um, practice, the endless hours of practice to make this magic trick or illusion look so effortless. So that was something that we tried to work into the design that the, you know, although these pieces involved very complicated engineering and manufacturing techniques, they felt effortless and they felt um, you know, just that they had that quality to them. And that is something also I bring to Stickley, which is trying to make the product look easy, that it, 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 it's there because it was meant to be, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, I loved learning from the factory, um, the skills of the craftsmen and the fixtures that would be made. You know, there's um, a lot of, uh, incredible thought that goes into um, fixtures and jigs to make production easier and that whole process. And I love seeing that kind of um, mindset in the studio. That's a view from my desk, um, looking out over the city. Now, I think Long Island City is completely, I don't even know if you could see that view anymore, um, but the Silver Cup studios were to the right there. Um, it was quite extraordinary experience being there. Um, these are some models I made at that time, and I, I'm showing these because I want to say, you know, how important models are to this day in my career. I used Rhino, I used 3D modeling, but I've never had that same um, feeling of what happens when you make a model, that, that there's things that occur that you could never think of in 3D. Um, for example, using the fluorescent acrylic and kind of just playing with that material and, and wrapping it in the skin and then having these metal components um, intersect that skin. This was actually designed for um, an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Museum called Skin. Um, so another, these are some more models, um, little fun sketch models that came about from my days at Dakotas, um, but just the ability to, to um, to explore materials and come up with forms that I wouldn't have thought of, like I said, necessarily um, in the computer. Uh, the little um, upholster chairs came from uh, playing around with the upholstery machine and working with the upholster who trained me how to use this industrial sewing machine to make these little models, which was actually quite scary at the time. Um, I always love the model down below, uh, be specifically because it's made from uh, packing tape and cardboard. But what that model did is it informed me of something that it could be. It gave me something, a feeling of like, oh, what if this became glass? You know, what if, what if all those cells could um, transfer light? And as the day progressed, this, this piece of furniture would change with the light. So that for me became um, 
such a wonderful experience working at Dakota is that he he allowed his studio, his designers to to take these kinds of you know go down these exploratory um, paths and and engage in that dialogue, um, discovering. At a certain point at Dakota, I had been with Dakota. Dakota for 13 years on and off. And there came a point where I, I really was itching to do my own thing. Um, I was seeing a lot of makers and, and designers uh, starting their own companies and brands. And I was still young enough that I felt like I could do that. I could contribute to that. So I went into business with Michael Graves, uh, which became problematic because it was a different Michael Graves. Um, and um, we worked down in Tribeca. We rented space from an architect and we started uh, doing our own production, small batch production furniture and showed at the furniture fair. And um, some nights we would get outside the studio and use the router. Uh, I'm sure we drove everybody crazy in Tribeca, but you know, you kind of get resourceful when you don't have a shop anymore. And it's amazing what you can achieve with uh, a router and a Dremel tool. Um, we also um, launched this bar stool at that time, which was an exciting project. And um, we sold them, we got a lot of press. We were a part of the design scene uh, where David Weeks and Jeffrey Burnett and all these young makers were kind of making their name and showing their work at this gallery called Totem Gallery. And at a certain point, our bar stool ended up uh, landing a spot with James Earl Jones for a Bell Atlantic ad. And that was so thrilling, you know, walking down the street in New York uh, for a while, these were on billboards, they were on the sides of buses. And I had that feeling of like, wow, we did it. We, we actually made something that, um, you know, got, was recognized and actually made us some money. It wasn't a lot. Um, I'll say this, that going into business with a creative, it's probably not the smartest idea. It's probably better to go into business with um, somebody who is uh, more business minded. So, um, but it was a fun, fun experience. After that, I, you know, at this point, I'm starting to, I'm, I'm married now, and I, I'm feeling I wanted to have a family, and I really needed more stability in my life. And um, I started to look around, but at that time, I actually got a call to go to Martha Stewart, to have an interview at Martha Stewart. And um, I wasn't sure if this was the right thing for me. I mean, I really, coming from Dakota, coming from having my own company to a huge brand, a huge corporation like Martha Stewart um, took some consideration, but I also had rent to pay and uh, a family had started. So I, I interviewed on a rainy day and it was the worst kind of day you wanna have an interview in New York City, riding on the train and getting there. And, uh, but I landed the job and it was um, kind of this, amazing experience when I got there. There was uh, so much talent at Martha Stewart. Um, she surrounds herself with the best talent in the industry. And there was a, an incredible energy there. There was an incredible, um, you know, uh, just everybody had something to contribute from some different kind of background. So the, the interesting part of her company is that it was an omnimedia company at that time. Um, she was, you know, designing into these categories of good, better, best. And when I say omnimedia, I say that she was, she had all the facets of her business. She had the editorial content, she had publishing, she had TV, she had the radio, and then she had merchandising. So I actually was involved in the merchandising side of things. And um, I was exposed to, uh, a lot of different categories that involved wood and metal. So kitchens, bath vanities, lighting, um, hardware, anything that was basically related to wood or metal came from my design team. And I was actually at this point, I was brought on at Martha Stewart to actually design her furniture with Bernhardt. And I thought that was the extent of it when I started because I had had um, my twins at that point, I had three daughters and I, um, I thought I could only do maybe three days a week and probably that's all I can do. But 
I quickly moved as Martha's business exploded and the design scene at that time was exploding, the internet and Instagram and everything was starting to um, expand dramatically, I, I um, came on board. And, and I'll, I'll say that it was a, I had this wonderful opportunity to work with my team of designers who were, um, there was just this great energy as I pointed out. We worked on a lot of categories that involved craft and strategy. And that is the biggest difference of working for Martha Stewart that we had to do these incredible pitches because I was starting to work as her business exploded and became more and more um, popular in the um, industry. Uh, big box stores started knocking on the door and Martha started doing all these partnerships. So she had partnerships with the Home Depot and then eventually with Staples and um, many others, Macy's. And um, this would have been like the type of presentation that would have taken place for one of those partners. This is the clear story when you would have entered Martha Stewart. Um, it was very you know, exciting and dramatic. There was so much content to pull from. Um, it became, it, it was a company that was inspiring for me because I was, I had kind of like, handed over my, you know, apron, the shop apron for a different kind of identity at Martha. Um, I was surrounded by women, uh, was surrounded, surrounded by um, all these ideas and um, could pull from many different parts of the company for inspiration. It showed me what it was like to be a part of a brand and that brand message and how important it is to be a brand and also how important it is to pitch an idea um, you know, everything in merchandising filtered back to the content from the books to the, and um, for example, the island to the left was designed from my team that would have come, come from my team. We would have considered all the aspects of what Martha would have need, needed in a baking cart and implemented that into the designs. Um, but the layer, the involvement here became more about pitches and how much effort and energy would go into conveying an idea and conveying an idea to non-creatives. Um, I think this is a really important point to make that as you design in your career, you will encounter that moment when you have to share your work with people who are not in the field of design. And how do you communicate that message? Um, my team and I would spend uh, a tremendous amount of time communicating, sorry, the brand, um, the messaging behind Martha Stewart and who she represented. So for example, we were designing kitchens for um, the Home Depot and we would have to analyze Martha Stewart's own kitchens and how she used them. She's a big proponent of that things function well, that they, uh, that she uses, she can use them efficiently, that they make your life easier, that they solve a solution. So for me, um, moving away from where I was at Dakota, this became something much more about strategy, about, um, distilling ideas, taking large amounts of content, and then putting them into a presentation that I could communicate to somebody who was not creative and, and sell that story. Um, this would have been some of the kitchens that we uh, produced and made from, um, for the Home Depot. And uh, I think this was the biggest challenge was working, um, finding inspiration in Martha's own homes, but then translating that into a mass retail environment and and what is the takeaway you know what are you how do you communicate all those qualities that make it a martha kitchen well it's the molding the crown molding is significant in her homes um, that her cabinets were these custom millwork things how do you take those extract those details and bring them into that mass market so we would identify um, things like the corbels the open shelving um, painted finishes became a huge part of who she was. Um, 
and also just identifying um, in these good, better, best categories, themes under contemporary, under traditional, under country, and really having to um, be strategic about who our audience was, who, who this message was going to go to. Um, Martha would actually try out our kitchens. The image on the left is one of the kitchens that she had built in one of her guest houses and she would test it and she had no problem coming back to us and coming back to me and telling me uh, what was working and what wasn't working, if the island was too big or too small. Um, and we would build in um, as many of these kind of attributes that she would bring to the table, but we also had to build in as many um, clever storage solutions. This carried through to other like other partnerships. This was um, Home Decorators Collection. This is uh, the Crafts Furniture line we came in came out with, which was super successful line of furniture, um, where we were collaborating with the crafts team and and pulling all the info that we got from the crafts department and how we would then incorporate that into this product. Um, and then again, you see the same piece on the left where Martha's repurposed it and made it flexible. And that was something that I learned there too, which was that design should be flexible. If it's good enough, it should be able to do um, many things. And I, I actually used some of that uh, with Stickley that when I'm creating a collection that it be flexible. But I think, um, you know, one of the things that was happening to me as a designer working for a big brand was that I was managing people now. I was at I was behind the person who was at the computer controlling the designs. And uh, although there was some really, um, it was a great learning experience for me, I missed that ability to be more involved in the process. And I'm talking about the process actually that happens when you're designing for a big brand or an outside manufacturer that you tend to lose your voice and your process there because often we would send our CADs off to get produced and they would, it felt like they were going into a, a whole, a black void or a void that we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the ability. I couldn't go into the shop anymore. I couldn't talk to the manufacturers and troubleshoot and um, build in their uh, strengths into the designs. Um, for me, that became, came, became challenging and frustrating. Um, another thing that I encountered, which I think is interesting for anybody in, in um, the visual, you know, graphic design or um, point of purchase design is when we would create product uh, and it would go on the shelf, it was very hard to, um, to tell that story, um, something that Martha was so was such a big part of the culture there was how beautiful and aspirational everything was and how important a photo shoot was in carrying that brand message. And when you work in these big box retailers, you're limited to um, much smaller areas to convey that messaging. And um, so we would meet often with the marketing team, the creative team, uh, the graphics design team to find ways of capsulating or condensing the message on the labels on these things. So that was also another challenge, an interesting challenge. Um, I, I really did enjoy traveling with Martha. We, we did a lot of video content together. We, we promoted kitchens. But one thing that I, I've always admired about her is that she is a woman of action. She doesn't um, dilly dally. She wants, if she wants something done, she's gonna get it done. She's gonna make it happen. She's gonna have an opinion about things. Um, she's going to get her message, the brand message across. And, you know, I would go with her on lectures where she would present to 600 people and she might not have been feeling that great that night, maybe had the flu, but she would turn it on. And I, I realized the importance of presenting. And that's something that I've taken a skill that I took from this situation to Stickley when I'm designing a collection, how important it is. And this can apply to anybody if you have your own, your own um, 
line of furniture or your own collection or whatever you're doing, that you are going to have to communicate your ideas or your brand or your message of who you are. Um, so that was a uh, valuable lesson that I learned from Martha. Um, eventually, you know, I'd been at Martha then, I, I would say that I was there for gosh, 11 years. And I was missing again, something which was those days of, of Dakota, of having that ability to be a part of that process, having more of a voice in design. It was getting to the point at Martha Stewart where I was, you know, longing for it so much that when I would go home at night, I would make my girls, uh, my three daughters, like models of furniture that they could play with for their dollhouse. And um, it was a wonderful way of kind of connecting with my girls because I had been working in a corporate environment. I was a single mom for a long time. And that for me was this moment of sort of connection and uh, longing to be back in making things. So that's how I went about it. Um, but eventually I, you know, as most brands stories go, uh, she actually sold her business and the writing was on the wall at that point that it was time to move on. And I started looking around for jobs. And, you know, I have to admit at this point in time, I was a little disillusioned by the industry. Um, I'm older now and I was feeling like whatever I was going to embark on, I needed it to be really special and something that really spoke to who I was at that point in my life, um, longing to go back into design and, and um, exploring my craft. So I actually cold email, not cold call, but cold emailed Stickley and the president uh, actually of Stickley reached out to me. And um, we had the opportunity to meet down in High Point. High Point is where, it's sort of the furniture capital of the US and that's where every October and April we launch a collection. And um, that is where I'll be launching my sixth collection with Stickley next month actually for pre-market and then in June for market it's been messed up the schedule because of COVID but I went to to um, High Point my husband encouraged me to fly down there and meet him in person which was the best advice ever and I walk the showroom with um, the president of Stickley and we we walk through and I was struck by uh, the furniture that was made from you know the mission furniture from the Stickley brothers um, this is where, you know, there's this company, Stickley is a 120 year old company. They uh, have a factory in upstate New York, not too far away from RIT, where they have 600 craftspeople working day and night. There's a day shift and a night shift. But they're a company that's rooted in this incredible history. Um, Gustav Stickley and his five brothers were um, makers in the 1800s, 1900s in Binghamton, New York, so near, near Manlius, near Syracuse, that area, who were in pioneers in the arts and crafts movement. So they were pulling all their uh, inspiration and, and excitement from what was happening in England in the arts and crafts movement with William Morris and John Ruskin, the writing of John Ruskin. And they pioneered and came to America with their message of what uh, American craft could be. And their work is very, to this day, um, very pragmatic, very pure. Um, you're celebrating the construction, the handmade. Uh, you're celebrating the clarity of the finishes and the beauty in the wood. The wood of choice back then and to this day actually is for the arts and crafts furniture is American white oak that's quarter sawn and you get that beautiful ray flaking of the grain. But this history resonated with me and I had learned about Stickley at RISD and I had seen Stickley furniture at the Met. So for me, this was a, a just so, it felt right and it felt um, like there was some wonderful thing happening or that could happen that would inspire me maybe to do something great for them. Um, I also was at a time where I, you know, like any job, you have to think hard, is this the right decision? Am I making the right choice? And, you know, I went back to the city, back to New York after my trip to High Point, and I was in their showroom. And I remember just 
wanted to look at, you know, the designs and the furniture and just absorb things. And I came across this um, cabinet and it drew me in and I thought it was quite beautiful. And I walked up to it and actually had some of my father's cookbooks. My dad was a, a career writer for Time Life Books. He wrote these iconic um, Foods of the World series cookbooks. And uh, it was incredible because my dad had just passed away that week or soon, you know, at that time in my life. And that was the moment that I felt there's some kind of connection here that's, that's, that's good. Um, and it has been good. So uh, the manufacturing facility is amazing. I travel up there once a month or more and um, have that dialogue with the engineers. Um, the bed, the piece on the left, upper left is actually one of the beds that I've designed for uh, the Park Slope collection. Um, but again, I'm, I'm back to my craft. Here's the bed on the right um, being worked on. But it's just been wonderful to experience um, the ability to design for a company that has integrity, is working with solid wood construction, which offers a completely different sensibility. I'm able to sculpt the forms more. I'm able to um, create pieces with integrity that have a lifespan that I enjoy. Um, the image on the right is kind of interesting. That was the first gift I got when I started there, which was they machined, the, the craftsman machined um, all the little increments of the spindles because spindles are such a prevalent or iconic look for mission furniture that I could have these spindles here when I'm drawing at my computer. And they've been so helpful because they actually help me um, with proportion and scale. Uh, one of the exciting things I'll say of working on collections for them has been seeing my designs on the factory floor and seeing that they are resonating with the customers. And um, there's something so thrilling, exciting about that. So the pieces on the upper left are some of the Park Slope sofas that came out of that first launch. Um, and just the, the excitement that goes with that. I still haven't given up on sketching and the importance of sketching. I'll say that when I'm on the phone talking to somebody, I'm usually doodling on post-its or drawing on a napkin. I'm constantly thinking about design. I'll say that having started at Stickley, um, the processes of creativity, creativity is endless. And as a creative, that's something important to remember because um, you never will run out of ideas. So it's better not to think of, think of your ideas as precious, but to just keep moving forward and creating and learning from each experience. I still go back to working on foam core models even to this day, um, just to work out ideas. And these are quick, quick sketches. They're not, they're throwaway. I think I just tossed that in the trash after I got what I needed to get out of it. But, um, and I also use obviously technology, but, I still go back to those, those early days at Dakota to inform me. I love building into the details. These are pieces that I launched at Stickley, the Walnut Grove stool on the left, and then some new pieces that have come out. Um, I love building in the hand craft into the furniture that I designed for Stickley. I love leveraging the craft of who they are as a company and celebrating the joints and, and um, making those connections artful. And so that you feel when you buy a collection that I've worked on, that you feel that it was made for you, that it has that kind of hand, um, hand machine, hand made quality to it. Um, connections like the one on the left are difficult to do. I mean, I push, I push stickly. I mean, some of the, I've met some of the woodwork in, on the factory floor have made some of my designs and they don't really like me that much. So, but some of them uh, do embrace what I'm doing, obviously. So, um, but I love building in moments like even the uh, hardware, the wood knob and the, you know, the experience that your hand comes into contact with that knob and that story, that tactile story or the integrated pull on the cabinet below. Um, you know, when I'm 
designing a collection, it's not it's not easy, I'll say. I, I have these moments of utter despair where I don't know where my thoughts are going or where I'm going to end up. But it usually starts with one idea, one motion back to my days at Dakota where I strike something where two lines uh, have meaning in my computer that suddenly offer something to me that speak to me and excite me and, and drive me to create this form. Um, this chair would be an example of that aha moment where I had played with this reverse taper transitioning into that cap rail and that became signature to the Park Slope collection. Um, you know, I was out of the gates, I, I was asked to, um, when I first started there, to design in the mission style and for me, that was quite daunting because a lot of that um, early arts and crafts furniture is quite perfect the way it is. And, you know, I wasn't sure how I could change it. So I started to evaluate the, the importance of the weight of the furniture and the permanence that that furniture spoke about and how could I lighten, lighten it and make it maybe a little more a little softer in its approach. So that, that gave way to these um, rounded forms and curves, um, which to this day has been very successful. Uh, my second collection of the gates was the Walnut Grove collection. This has turned out to be probably the most successful collection at Stickley. I'm very, very proud of it. Um, it's, it the wood is actually American block, black walnut and um, I think what, you know, when I was working on this collection, I was very much uh, concerned with how all the proportions play together. And that to me is the art of designing collection is how do these pieces relate? How do they play off of each other to create um, connections? And I do that through the details. This is the Walnut Grove upholstered bed and the dresser um, and nightstands. But I try and make connections, as I said, through the details and um, bring that sense of handwork that there's a lot of care that goes into these pieces so that if you were to just buy one of them, you would feel like you bought something special and unique. Um, this is the Walnut Grove uh, table that expands with leaves. The credenza in the background can be used as a console or can be used as server. Um, so again, the flexibility is important in the designs I create, the usability. Um, not everybody has space. Um, so I think about that also coming from an urban um, place, living in Brooklyn, where you don't have a ton of space to incorporate furniture. So the footprint of this collection was smaller, but I'll say even though it was inspired by uh, mid-century modern influences, I've tried to update it and make it my own through the proportions um, and, and really playing off of that. Um, the spindle bed um, shows the beautiful craftsmanship, uh, drawing that, or actually um, that line that comes up on the side of the headboard and, and transitions into the headboard is really difficult to do. Um, so again, bringing in that art, that handcraft into the design has very much resonated with customers. Um, this is the Park Slope bed, playing off of those, those curves that I showed you before in the chair and creating this sheltering headboard. Um, kind of just this elegance that occurs with the reverse taper and that cap rail detail and the shaping that went into sculpting it. I love my pieces to be very sculptural and um, fluid and um, anyways that that is the end of the Park Slope collection so I am going to say one last word and then step go into a Q&A with all of you but um, you know a friend of mine said this quote and I love it which is your career makes sense in the rearview mirror and I couldn't agree more because you know I've had the luxury of going back in time to see all the things that work for me from a craft, from identifying um, craft, identifying how it is to design in with computers and how to navigate um, 
the world that I have been a part of, but you will embark on your own journey and your time is unique right now. I mean, even you living during a pandemic and what you've been through and the experiences you're going to bring to your designs is only just beginning. So thank you so much. And I am going to um, stop sharing my screen here and, and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Marissa. You. That was uh, fantastic. And um, we have uh, a number of questions that are coming into me through a variety of channels. Oh, so please. I think I'm going to uh, try to um, get to as many of them as we can. Uh, the first one that I'm seeing says, um, how do you define success? And how do you know when you've achieved it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'd say I've defined success by, you know, I use Stickley as an example. When I signed on to work with Stickley, I didn't know if I could do it, to be honest, because I had been so removed from my days at Dakota of drawing day in and day out, and then working for Martha, where I had become a, in the, was in the role of a manager. I wasn't sure that I could draw all these things. And I think the success for me, it's not monetary. It's not, it has nothing to do with getting paid the right amount of money or any of that. For me, it's um, that I'm able, I achieved something and I actually made something happen that I'm actually very proud of. I think um, that is success when you can be proud of something that you've achieved and made, I think a lot of us um, should take more pride in what we do. And um, that has been something that I've, I've learned through working for Stickley. I feel like anything is possible right now that I, I've, I've you know, overcome things of um, fear. I think a lot of us operate under fear as well. And how do we overcome fear? Um, you overcome it by just doing it and taking risks. And um, I sure have, and it's paid off. So, um, yeah. That's a great answer. Um, there's a related question here about um, determining financial value uh, in your work. And I, I think that's kind of an open question relative to you know, how you um, assert uh, cost in the, in the different projects that you've done. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. That's an interesting question because I, you know, when you're designing into different price points, um, I think it's an easier dialogue to be had or an, a different, an easier investigation of design when you're able to have an open dialogue with an engineer. And I think that that's where I was challenged at Martha because that dialogue ended. And so once the designs left the computer, that dialogue ended. Now when I'm designing, I am always um, talking about, you know, I'll send my CADs because I'm actually the one drawing the front view, top view, side view sections to the engineer. And together we will talk about, well, is this coming out of six quarter lumber? Or is this gonna, you know, it'll cost a lot more if we do this or, so as, as long as, a, as, when you're a designer, as long as you know the parameters of which you are designing into, and the better you get at your skill and you have that dialogue with engineering, you're going to be able to target the audience that you need to target, I guess is what I would say. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? I mean, it, uh, yeah. it, it depends on the medium too. If you're designing uh, KD furniture versus solid wood construction, you're already dealing with a different price point. Um, but yeah, so. Interesting. Um, another question just came in. Um, Marissa, you mentioned that you will have to communicate who you are through your design. Where can you find the source of inspiration to make your own design language that tells your story? Huh. Well, I think it's taken me a while to get there. It's taken, you know, I'm still learning how to create that voice as I've gotten better at my craft. I, uh, I still want to, you know, become more 
maybe looser about how I approach design and maybe that's how my voice will come out with the designs. Um, but I think it just comes from exploring and like I said, doing, uh, you'll find what's right for you and being authentic to yourself. Um, I know when I'm in the computer and I've looked at too much Instagram or too many beautiful images on the internet that you can become um, consumed by that. And I, I know then that I'm not being authentic and um, authenticity is something that you become more aware of as you mature as a designer. And, um, you know, it's just how do you make something your own? If you're looking at the past for inspiration, how do you then um, make this, this item, this design something of you? Um, just like I had to do with the Park Slope collection. How did I, how did I get, a, get my voice back in that regard? Um, it's, it's an art form, it takes experience and it, it's something you'll work at. Right, easier to see in the rear view mirror. Exactly. <laughs> Um, another really good question. In what ways do you feel that you have faced adversity being a woman in a male dominated industry and mm -hmm. how do you approach and overcome it? Well, that's a really good question. I, I was going to go there a little bit in my lecture and I kind of shied away from it, but I, um, yeah, I worked in a factory with all men I mean, 60 men and me. And, um, I, it was challenging. I mean, I, I can give you countless examples of how challenging my career was in the early days, but I overcame it by just sticking to what I believed in. I mean, I'd go out in the shop in Dakota's factory and get on the bandsaw and get on the sand belt and all eyes were on Marissa and, uh, you know, just so I didn't kill myself or, you know, just this, uh, this tremendous pressure, but, um, you know, you just move on and stay strong. And, and, and I, I did, I persevered. It took me probably longer to get where I am today in some ways, um, but that wasn't, wasn't a concern. I don't know, I just kept, I had my own thoughts about myself, my own integrity about what, who I wanted to be. And I kind of shut out some of that, um, that behavior that was around me that could be very discouraging and very disappointing, uh, could make me very, very angry at times, but it didn't serve me well, you know? So I just kept going, I guess is the word. Great. Yeah. Um, another question is how do you wiggle yourself out of creative block? Does inspiration usually come by chance? Yeah. Oh, that's a good, okay. Well, so I just finished my last, collection. I handed over all the designs and we're going to see it in High Point in April. And designing during COVID has been challenging, designing in a pandemic, um, because I've been very isolated. I've been sitting at my computer behind me day in and day out without much dialogue, except for the dialogue that I have with, um, you know, my boss at Stickley or, or the engineer. But I stay inspired just was that the question staying inspired or how do you stay inspired, right? Inspired yeah, by. or how do you forgive yourself out of a creative block, yeah. I just keep going at it. It's that perseverance. Um, there are days when I wanna pack it up and be, you know, I'm done with this field like I am done. And I uh, just, I have this tendency to stick with it um, and keep drawing. And I'll say, when you do that, you will hit something, you will discover something. I go through days where I don't even know if I'm gonna have a collection at the end of the season, um, where I've made a hundred ideas just to get down to five, or, you know, I'm just saying that there's this commitment that you have to go through as a designer and um, there's no way around it and you get through it. You find ways to get through it. You find ways if you're, if you're stuck, make a model or look at something or, or you know, we find inspiration as designers in the most unusual places. I mean, I, I gather just walking down the street and through Brooklyn or um, emotional things that are going on in my life that I'm not even aware of that are affecting me and how I design. Um, but I tap into those things and, and, and make them an asset. 
So pulling, being very resourceful for resourceful with what I have, um, not going to trade shows right now, not seeing all these fabulous things, but sitting in my room here. Um, so I look at history a lot too, historical pieces. I love that too. Great. Well, you're, you're answering a lot of um, similarly framed questions that I'm trying to stitch together, uh, but yeah. there are a lot of good questions coming in. Right. I want to speak in one of my own, which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, you, you, you hang this tantalizing detail out in your bio that you um, have had a, a 180 year old uh, farmhouse, right. a pragmatic farmhouse, too, um, which uh, is, is in the family and that you visit often, or you, it, I, I inferred that you visit often. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us what details about this place uh, moved you growing up or, or visiting it? Oh, well, it's, it's a sacred place for me, my father, it's, on, it was from my father's side of the family. And uh, it was, my dad grew up in the Bronx. He was a New Yorker and, um, you know, had a tough childhood. And I think going up to the farm with his family was like his sacred time. And it was a, a very personal time. And for me, I, I knew that story and I knew how much that, that place, the farm means to him. And, uh, you know, there's this furniture, there's an old wood burning stove in the, in the main entrance of the house, like one of those old sterling cast iron stoves. Um, and that's at the heart of the home. And then there's this mismatch of furniture throughout the house. And, but I love, for me personally, I love the story that those objects play in, in the history of my family's life. Um, they're nothing fancy. They're actually, some of them are pretty awful, but I love the memories that they bring to, to the table. Um, I love the experience of family convening there. There's no internet, you know, it's almost like a time capsule um, in the attic or diaries from my relatives and um, bonnets and old dresses. And so there's a rich, rich history there that I will always associate with um, my dear dad, who I love dearly and, and, and I think of when I'm up there, but also just the happiness and um, the struggle that my family went through living there. Uh, um, my Aunt Ella lived in this house all alone and the long winters upstate and being in that house alone and her only joy was actually getting her mail you know, going out to the, the hitching post to get her letters. So, so there's this rich, rich story of that, of the farm. And I will forever be uh, grateful for that um, grounding in my life, you know, so. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with yeah. us. Um, I think we're, we're about out of time, um, but I, I do want to thank you again for this fantastic uh, talk and, and really wonderful dialogue afterwards. And I, I wanna pull a quote from one of our um, folks who's out there asking questions. Uh, and, um, and this one says uh, to you, discipline is a demonstrable component in your success. It can't be underestimated. Your work exemplifies the result of focus, determination, expertise, creativity, and execution. A big kudos. I oh, could have said that better myself, and I think this is a great way well, to learn. Thank you so much. I really <laughs> appreciate that. And uh, I would love to come up to RIT or give a tour of Stickley when we have uh, that opportunity and uh, anytime. So That's wonderful. Well, we, I, I might hold you to that. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Let's do <laughs> both ways. You're, you're most welcome here. We okay. love to host you. Um, so. Uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Marissa, for taking the time to share your, your wisdom with us. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. I uh, want to remind you to uh, visit the Vignelli website, join our mailing list so you can stay tuned for future events. We'll have one more of these Vignelli Design Conversations lectures uh, in April. Um, and as I said, join the mailing list, visit the site, and, uh, and we'll keep you posted on the specifics. So thank you again, um, Marissa you. and uh, everybody. Have a wonderful thank night. You. Stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>